Well, good morning. Thank you, two of you, for that. Um, every, every now and then there is a, a sentence that changes your life. And I want to share with you a sentence that has changed my life. It picks up the theme of what we've just been singing. It sets us up for what we're about to be reading in God's Word. And it's this, the way in is the way on. The way into the Christian life is the way on in the Christian life. Our way into the Christian life was not a blaze of glory, of achievement on our part. It was, it was desperation, it was helplessness, it was dependence on God. And guess what? The way on in the Christian life is the same. So would you um, find Galatians chapter 3? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14. Uh, if you've got a Bible to hand, you need to have these words in front of you this morning. And I'm going to pick up Dr. White's custom and ask you to stand as I read these words uh, to us. Galatians 3, 1 through 14. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Brothers and sisters, this is God's word. Do be uh, seated. And we will look at these words together. Um, put your hand up if you can drive, if you've got a driver's license. Okay, keep your hand up if you've ever had to drive on the other side of the road somewhere else. There's a, a few of us. I've, I've had to learn to do that this semester. Okay, it's my first time driving on your side of the road. And it's not easy. Uh, learning to drive itself is, takes a, a fair bit of work. Uh, but the great thing is once you've learned to drive, it becomes second nature. You kind of don't have to think about it. Um, what you, you do, a, you should think when you drive. Let me just p PSA, let you know that. But it's kind of, it becomes instinctive. But when you then have to drive on the other side of the road, it, you suddenly realize that every instinct you have is now wrong. Uh, for me, I keep reaching for a, a, a gear shift stick that isn't there. Uh, every time I go around the corner and turn on the, the kind of turn signal, I, I put the wipers on, because that's around the other way as well. Uh, just once or twice, I have driven out onto an empty road on my side of the road. And one or two other drivers have quickly found their own special way to alert me to the <laughs> inappropriateness of doing that. Uh, I know people who've, who've moved countries and had to learn to drive on the other side of the road, and even after years, they still do that. It is really hard for those instincts to be overcome. Our intuitions are, are all the wrong way round. And there's something similar going on in Galatians. For the first two chapters of this letter, Paul has been stressing over and over again that what he's been telling everyone, what he's been preaching, 
has been the gospel of God. And therefore, what he's been preaching has not been the gospel of man. So have a look at uh, chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. There is such a thing as man's gospel. And Paul says, his message is not that. He's not picked it up from another man at all. All of it has come to him from God. And therefore, the gospel of God, the message Paul is preaching, is unique. Friends, that the message of Jesus Christ is not like anything you will ever hear anywhere else in your life. It is not a message any of us would ever have come up with. And what Paul means by man's gospel is, is the way that all of us naturally end up thinking. Uh, left to our own devices, when we start to think about God, eternal life, heaven and hell, all of these sorts of things, what we come up with every single time is the gospel of man. It would look a little bit different here and there. You've got this, this belief system over here and that religion over there. But it always has the same basic idea. It's the way that all of us are wired to think the universe works. And that is that it is down to us. Whatever it is we need to, to get to after we die, it's down to us to do it. That's just the way we think. That is the gospel of man. Whatever it is, you've got to attain it. You've got to merit it. You've got to obey it. You've got to earn it. You've got to achieve it. And so Paul is saying he's teaching the gospel of God and it is totally different. Uh, we never would have come up with it. Paul is saying God loves to give his very, very greatest blessings to people who do not deserve anything. Think about that. God, gives, God loves to give his greatest blessings to people who do not deserve anything. God loves to do that. It's not that he, he kind of can and so he now feels he ought to. God loves to. It pleases him to. To give his very best gifts to those who don't deserve anything, those who've never deserved anything, those who would never deserve anything. And all we do is receive those blessings that God gives to us in Christ. And that is what Paul calls faith. It's, it's letting this gift fall into our laps. But the gospel of man is so baked into us that even when we've received and believed the gospel of God, we will still turn it back into the gospel of man. It's like if I lived here for, for years and years and years, still every now and then reverting to driving back on the left-hand side of the road. Spiritually, that's what we do. We, we take the gospel of God and if we're not careful, we keep turning it back into the gospel of man. And so like with me and driving here, it, it takes, I've got to be conscious of this. I've got, to be, I've got to drive on your side of the road. I've got to keep being in that mindset. And that is what the Galatians have been doing. They have been reverting back to the gospel of man. They've been reverting back to that mindset that says, no, it's really down to us and what we do. And the particular way they've been doing that is with the law of, of Moses in the Old Testament. They've been saying, listen, if we nail the Old Testament law, we have nailed Christianity. And so they were trying to obey the commands. They were encouraging people to get circumcised, thinking if we do all these things, we've nailed Christianity. Now, that is not the immediate danger for Cedarville University. I don't hear of people trying to implement the law of Moses. Uh, refusing any of the pork at Chuck's. I've not heard of discipleship groups kind of practicing circumcision in, in the halls. <laughs> I 
But we do have the same danger. We will find our own way of of turning the gospel of God back into the gospel of man. It won't be the Galatian way. It won't be the Mosaic law way. It will be a peculiarly us kind of way, 21st century, cedarville type Christians kind of way. And so what we do is we think to ourselves, well, this is, this is what the Christian life is meant to look like. So as long as I'm doing this, I'm nailing Christianity. And subtly it becomes all down to what I do. And without realising it, we're driving on the wrong side of the road and it is just as dangerous. And so Paul has been writing this letter to say to them, get back on the other side. You're going to crash. So look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul, Paul doesn't mince his words. He doesn't soft pedal. He says, oh foolish Galatians. Paul is saying, you guys, you... How can you be so stupid? I was trying to think what it would be like for them to receive this letter in their church. Can you imagine the word goes round, the kind of email to the church membership goes round saying, guys, we've got a letter from Paul. Come this Sunday, we're going to have Paul's letter read to us. And you can imagine how excited they would be. They're thinking, this is, this is not just there's a new exciting series on Netflix that's now available. This is, we've got a new bit of Bible and it's written to us. Come to church, we're going to debut the next bit of the New Testament. <laughs> and you can imagine them coming. Paul's actually written a letter. Is it, is it just to us or is it to a few other? No, it's just to us. He's written, he's written Galatians in the letter. And you can imagine them saying, well, what's, what's, what's the title? And the elders like, it's the letter to the Galatians. Like, seriously, we're going to be in the Bible, guys. Our church is in the Bible. For the rest of Christian history, people are going to know of the Galatians. Our church is going to be famous. So you can imagine them listening to this letter thinking, and Paul says, Paul, an apostle, blah, 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 to the churches in Galatia. That's us. That's us. I'm in the Bible there. And the letter continues. Let me get to chapter 3, verse 1. And Paul says, You idiots. You complete idiots. But look at what he's saying in verse one. He's saying, who has bewitched you? He says, seriously, guys, has someone messed with your minds? Did all of you kind of fall over and hit your head? Are you for real? Because what you are doing is so unthinkably stupid. You are turning the gospel of God into stuff we do. So look at what he says in the second part of verse one. He says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Wow. Paul is saying, your eyes saw the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean there was a, there was a, a bus ride from Galatia to Jerusalem, a church outing to visit the crucifixion. No, something amazing happened. Paul turned up in Galatians Paul preached the gospel of God to these people. And through the preaching of the apostle Paul, before their eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Okay, Paul didn't turn up with a flip chart and a packet of of Sharpies. He didn't kind of do a Pictionary on the death of Jesus. But as the message of Jesus was preached, it came home to them with such vividness that they realised this death was for them. 
this message came home with such vividness that it was as if they were there and in front of Jesus when he died. Now, all of us will have people in our lives that we long would see Jesus Christ. People we wish could see the Jesus that we know and love. This reminds us they need to hear the message of Jesus. They need to have God open the eyes of the heart. Some of us in this room need to see Jesus afresh. We need to come back to the gospel accounts of his death for us and to pray for God again to open the eyes of our hearts. The Galatians had seen the death of Jesus for them and now they were denying it. Now notice, they they hadn't got their doctrinal statement out and and got out some red ink and, and crossed things out and added new things. It wasn't in any of their official doctrine that they had denied this. It was in the way they lived. It was in their culture. And so Paul says in verse 2, let me ask you only this. And he fires a a series of questions at them that are meant to be like a a bucket of cold water over them. Let me just, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, guys. You've turned the, the Christian life into what you do. So let me tell you, did you receive the Spirit by what you do? Was it was that how it worked? You were doing and doing and doing and doing and obeying and obeying and obeying and then you unlocked the Holy Spirit level. Did you receive the Spirit by your achievement? Was that something you accomplished? Verse 3, are you, again, he calls them stupid a lot. In this passage, verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Again, Paul is giving us just a beautiful snapshot of the Christian life. We begin by the Spirit. Your Christian life began by the Holy Spirit. You didn't clever your way into faith in God. It wasn't that you were smart enough to to become a Christian. Accomplished enough, clever enough, wily enough. God had to put something of himself in you for you to reach out and trust in him. And yet the Galatians are effectively saying, actually, we we can take it from here. Thanks for starting us off, Holy Spirit. That was was super helpful. Couldn't have begun without you, but I think we're fine from now. We'll take it from here. Verse 4, Paul says, just think of what you've been through. Really, what kept you going? What helped you persevere? It wasn't that you gritted your teeth and kind of just pushed your way through it. No. Verse 5, think of all that God has done among you. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? Think of those incredible answers to prayer you've seen in your Christian life. Think of the conversions that you've seen, including your own. Think of the lives you've witnessed God put back together. Was that you? Was that your ministry? Was that your skill? Was that your hard work? Should God be thanking you for those things?
No, Paul says it's because you heard with faith. Friends, Paul is saying in verse 5, the Christian life is hearing with faith. That is how it works. God speaks to us. He speaks to us promises. And so all we do is hear him and believe that God can do what he says he will do. And apart from God's promises, we do nothing. That is how we started the Christian life. We heard with faith. God should not love you. And he really shouldn't love me. But he does. He's told us that. He's demonstrated his love for us. Don't you love that verse in Romans 5? I love the tenses. God demonstrates present tense, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, past tense, Christ died for us. How do you know God loves you today? Jesus died for you then. How do you know God loves you today? Well, I have been, you know what? It's only 10.34, but I, I don't think I've sinned yet this morning. God loves me. I'm rocking it today. No, God loves you today because Jesus died for you then. We heard the message that God loves sinners like us. And we believed it. Uh, Paul moves on in verse 6 to, to, to wheel in Abraham as, a, as evidence for this. He says, listen, think about Abraham and this will help you. The Old Testament will help you keep trusting the gospel of God. And that the folks in Galatians, uh, Galatia are saying, this is great because Abraham proves our point. But he really doesn't. Verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham matters because, well, it's a bit like, every, it's a bit like Star Wars. If you have a certain mindset and you look hard enough, everything is a bit like Star Wars. Uh, Genesis 1 to 11 is like the opening crawl at the beginning of a Star Wars movie. It's the background, it's, it's the where things are at, it's that this is the state of play, and then Genesis 12, with Abraham showing up, is the beginning of the main storyline of the Bible. And how God treats Abraham is defining of how he treats everyone. So if you want to know how things work with God and people, look at Abraham. What did Abraham do? Verse 6, Abraham believed God. Verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul doesn't call Abraham the man of achievement, the man of attainment. He calls him the man of faith. God turned up to Abraham's life with extraordinary promises. Abraham believed God. And Paul says it was counted to him in verse 6 as righteousness. Friends, that means Abraham was not naturally righteous. Abraham was from a pagan background. It wasn't that God thought he was brimming with spiritual potential. Even after he became a believer, Abraham was still a mess. You read through the account of his life and the stuff he does, he was a mess. But he was a mess who believed God. Who believed that God's 
promises are bigger than our mess. And Paul's point is any of us can get in on this. Verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Do you want to be a son of Abraham? You don't have to check your ancestry and your family tree. You have to have faith. To become part of the family of Abraham, you need to have the faith of Abraham. That is the likeness that matters. It's not do I have Abraham's eyes, do I have Abraham's hairline. It's do you have Abraham's faith? And friends, it is such good news because Abraham really did mess up so much. And if Abraham is the man of faith that God counts as righteous, then it means the very weakest of us, the very messiest of us, can come to God as we are and receive the very same promises and blessings that Abraham received. Well, in the next few verses, Paul, again, backs this up with some other parts of the Old Testament. He's saying, listen, this is, it is just so ridiculous to think that the center of the Christian life is what you do. Verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If you're going to go down that route, you will never pull it off. If your Christian life becomes about what you do, you will never do enough. If you're going to perform, you will, you've got to be perfect. You've got to obey everything. You've got to do the whole thing. The pass mark is 100% and obeying the law of God means obeying all of God's law. And the whole point of the law, Paul is saying, is to show us that we can't do that. Verse 11, now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. It's never been about obeying your way into spiritual advancement. The whole point of the law is to show up our need for God's mercy. Uh, When I go to the, the dentist back home, I presume it's the same here, one of the things they sometimes get me to do is there's a, a cup of kind of some pink liquid and you, you swill it around in your mouth and spit it out and it shows up all the dirt and, and plaque on your teeth. You have the same thing here? Anyone been to the dentist, like, ever? <laughs> I thought it was the Brits who had bad teeth, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. And Paul is saying that is what the law does. It's there to show up the sin in our hearts. The whole point of God's law is to show us that I'm not, I'm not like this. I can't do this. I'm nothing like this. And so the message has always been, we need to trust God and not ourselves. And Paul is saying that is the message of the Old Testament. It's always been about trusting what God does for us, not trusting what we do for him. So verse 12, the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Paul is saying the death of Jesus is for us. The sign that you were disobedient, the sign that you were under God's curse was that you were hung on a tree. And Paul is saying that is what happened to Jesus Christ. He was stuck onto a piece of wood. We see the Lord Jesus under a curse. And the whole point is he came under the curse we deserve, the curse we earned, so that we can receive the blessings he deserves. And so Christianity has never been about what we can do do that is not our focus that is not our trust and that is why the gospel of God is so different to anything we've ever known it's why all of our instincts go the wrong way on this and we keep turning Christianity well if I do into if I do this 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 and this then I'm fine 
we turn it back into the gospel of man. Um, I was talking to a, a salesman a few months ago who was telling me about how, how work is going for him, the company he works for. He'd recently closed a massive deal. And I say to him, that's got to feel pretty good. And he's saying, the trouble is you're only as good as your last deal. What's the next one going to look like? I saw a, a sportsman being interviewed on TV and he was saying, you're only as good as your last match. Only as good as your last result. Actors will say, you're only as good as your last role. What's the next one going to look like? Spoke to a politician back home a few months ago who said, you're only as good as your last election, and my last election was pretty bad. It's the way we're wired to think, and so as Christians, we tend to think our Christianity is only as good as our last quiet time, our last small group attendance, our last prayer meeting, our last moment of, of temptation resisted, our last evangelistic opportunity taken. And we turn it into the gospel of man. So someone asks you, how's your Christian life going? What do we immediately think of? We think of what we do. How's my Christian life going? Yeah, I read, read my Bible today, so that's, that's okay. Yeah, I didn't, I, I kind of did some witnessing then. So yeah, I think, yeah, my, my Christian life's going well. The gospel of God says, your Christianity is only as good as your saviour. So now, now how's your Christian life going? We need to continue to see Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified. We need to continue as we began by the Holy Spirit. We need to continue as we began by hearing with faith. Hearing each day that because Jesus Christ died for me, someone who continues to be utterly undeserving can receive and enjoy the greatest blessings God has to give. God loves to bless those who don't deserve anything. And the way in is the way on. Let me pray. Father, there is no folly in the Bible that we can't so very, very easily fall into. So protect us from the folly of these Galatian Christians. Protect us from turning Christianity into what we do. Protect us from making our confidence in ourselves and in our performance. Father, help our eyes not to be on what we're doing and how impressive or, or disastrously unimpressive that looks. Help us to look and keep our eyes on Jesus. To know that because he died then, we can be assured of your love for us now. Father, help us to remember how we began. By your spirit, by your grace, by your kindness, by your help, by your love. 
and help us to continue in those very same things. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.